I am joined today on the Getting to Know You podcast by the wife uh, of Alex Rains, her loving husband, who I interviewed many weeks ago. We have been battling some tech issues, uh, some compression problems. That's all beside the point. But I am joined for, I believe, a third, maybe fourth time by Jamie O'Keefe Rains, uh, her loving husband's loving wife, uh, on the northeast coast of Australia. So, Jamie, welcome back yet again. Please tell the people where you live. Good morning, Tim. Um, it is is about 10 o'clock or so on a Sunday morning in cloudy Townsville today. Townsville is, as you said, on the northeast coast of Australia. So for those who struggle with the north and the east part of things, it's the pointy bit on the right-hand side of Australia. Um, we are in the tropics. And for us, this is coming to the end of our wet season. So. We have bits of rain all the time. The grass grows the second you stop cutting it. And it's very steamy and lots of mosquitoes and, and biting midges and stuff like that around. So really, really um, selling the place, I think. <laughs> it does sound a bit like South Louisiana where I live. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so tell me, uh, where did you grow up? I know it was not not in Townsville. No, so I was born in Brisbane, which is the Queensland state capital, and that's about 14, 1500 kilometres to the south of Townsville in what's called the southeast corner of Queensland. And um, I was born in the late 60s, so yes, I'm much older than, than you and than of Alex. Um, and I lived there until I was about 10, and then we moved to Cairns, which is 400 kilometres north of us, even more in the tropics. Tell me a little bit about your family, what your parents did growing up, and uh, I think you have three older brothers as well. Yeah, so three older brothers. Uh, one turned 66 yesterday. Um, he is currently unemployed. Um, he is, uh, he is his wife's carer. She has um, throat cancer and assorted other in, uh, illnesses. And he's got, uh, he's recently had uh, a heart bypass, triple bypass, and he's got a kidney transplant. So it's, I think it's a bit of the blind leading the blind with those two being carers for each other. Um, my next eldest, next brother uh, lives just uh, to the north of Brisbane and he is uh, an operatically trained music teacher. Uh, he teaches uh, everyone ranging from like three-year-olds all the way up to people in their 80s. And, and the third brother lives just to the south of Sydney, which is a long way away to the south of here. Um, and he is uh, a stage lighting technician for the Sydney Town Hall. Um, so he does, makes lots of flashy lights and smoke bombs and stuff like that for shows in the, in the tin, Sydney Town Hall. Um, my father was an orthodontist. Um, he trained originally, of course, as a dentist and then when the powers that be decided that orthodontia was a was a a thing that needed uh, qualifications he got his qualifications came through under like a grandfather clause so he'd been doing it for however many years all he had to do was prove that he knew what he was doing and there you know there's your qualifications without having to go back to uni again and um mum for like the fir my first seven years was a stay-at-home mum. Uh, she had to leave school when she was 15 because that's when her mother passed away and she had to go out and get a job. And so that was, you know, in the, in the 1940s. She had to go out and get a job to, to keep herself alive. But when I was about seven, she went back to high school and got her... Uh, 
whoops, got what was called her matriculation, so her high school certificate. And then she went back to university and she got a Bachelor of Arts in um, geomorphology and geology and things like that. And then when I was about 17, she went to uni and got uh, her master's in archaeology. So that was, that's the five of them. Um, and mum and dad have both passed now, unfortunately, but that's what happens. Um, and when All I was right. 10, well, dad bought a, a, a dental practice in Cairns. So we moved to Cairns. And he was the only orthodontist north of Townsville for many years. So having, having patients from all over North Queensland and Papua New Guinea and places like that, because there was no other people to, to look after them. I'm sure that kept him busy. Uh, tell me about growing up down there. I know you said you realized uh, some entertainment value around five years old on top uh, of the fence. <laughs> yes, yeah. So mum and dad met in the early 1950s at a place called Lamington Plateau. So it's uh, Lamington National Park was Queensland's first national park declared in 1926 or something like that. And um, a, fa a family called the O'Reillys had uh, a guest house at Lamington Plateau. And for the young things in Brisbane at the time in the 50s, late 40s and 50s, going up to, to Green Mountains and Lamington Plateau was the thing to do on weekends. And so they'd make this this trek and it was a trek at the time because it was up a switchback dirt road up the side of a mountain um, and it's slippery red clay and it would have been dangerous as anything but so adventurous because that's what you were doing because you were you know, in your 20s and it was all very exciting. And so they would go up there and they would go bushwalking and things like that. And my mother's sister had a job in the kitchen up there and so mum would go up to visit her and dad went up to to do the the social thing on the weekend one weekend and they met up there and were rarely apart after after that my brothers and I all joke that we were all conceived up there because we spent so much time up the mountain as as a family and as when as when we were children we were as kids we all we would all just run around all the time up there like feral little feral beasts just appearing in time for food um whenever we were hungry you know much much as kids should do um and so it was it's a tourist place and lots of tourists go there lots and lots of birds they have an annual bird week and people come around from all over the world to see this these spectacular birds that are uh, that are there in the rainforest and as kids we would be feeding the crimson rosellas which are a type of parrot so they're this type of parrot and they're very tame because for generations people have been feeding hand feeding these birds so you'd have a handful of seed and uh, you know three or four birds would land on your hand so you'd have a handful on the other hand as well and then they'd land on your head and they'd be on your shoulders and all this sort of stuff and there's a post and rail, there were post and rail fences outside the guest house. And more of the, the, the risk taking that small children should be doing, we'd be walking along the post and rail fence and you'd have your hands out and so you'd have birds all over you and all these on this post and rail fence and tourists would be saying, how are you doing that? How are you doing that? And so from about four or five years old you'd start lying to tourists about how you get these birds to do things and and how they're going to eat their own children and all this sort of stuff and so you just lie to tourists because it's fun so yeah it's an Australian definitely an Australian thing we love lying to tourists I think I told you last time I actually saw that on Facebook that uh Australian <laughs> storytellers sure like to be full of shit sounds like that's correct yeah, yeah, what's yeah, the, the wildest thing? What's what's the wildest thing you shared with the tourist? Oh shit, that one's hard. Um, 
I don't know. It's like a couple of a couple of months ago, I was I led a, t uh, a walk on Magnetic Island, which is just off the coast here at Townsville, and I had you know a dozen American university students, and we were looking for koalas. So it's like we went for a walk in a place where you know essentially you're not quite tripping over them, but you get almost guaranteed to see koalas in the wild. And so we we walked up. We saw some koalas, they got very close. They all took photos. They were all very, very pleased. But there's also some birds that are around on the islands, which are called blue wing kookaburras. And blue wing kookaburras, when there's a bunch of them, they, one of their common names is howlers. So they sound a bit like howler monkeys. So we're walking back down from seeing all these koalas and the blue wing kookaburras started their howling. And these students all said, oh, are they howler monkeys? And it's like, yes, yes, they are. Absolutely, they're howler monkeys. And it's like, oh, really? Can we see them? It's like, no, they're not howler monkeys. We don't have monkeys in the wild here. We've got everything else, but no monkeys. <laughs> do some homework before you go um, <laughs> and they're like no those are small birds they're not monkeys um, but at different times you know you tell different stories there's too many too many to try and remember all of them unfortunately well take me through your uh, your academic career from childhood all the way up I know you had a few left turns yeah so um, like I said we were in Brisbane till I was about 10. So primary school in Brisbane was the local Catholic primary school, which was sort of a five or 10 minute walk, depending on how short your legs were. Um, and for the first few years, walking with my brothers or walking with the, the kids from next door, because we're all, you know, all the good Catholic families all living in the same space in Brisbane. So we'd walk up to the school and then walk home again in the afternoon. Um, so we left Brisbane when I was at the end of my grade five. Um, so like you know, 10 years old, we moved to Cairns and then another primary school, Catholic primary school in Cairns. And at that stage, um, I, and I have got, I've got absolutely no idea if it's the same, but at that stage you had, uh, boys and girls at the school until end of grade four. And then at for grade five, the boys went to junior school at the boys' Catholic high school, which was a strange thing. And then we just had girls at the school for five, six and seven. I don't know the reasoning behind that, but maybe maybe everybody was frightened of puberty or something. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, Catholic school again in Cairns and then Catholic girls' school in Cairns, which was you know, in the, in the early 80s was very much geared towards making good Catholic wives, not making good Catholic scholars or anything like that. It was, you know, you, these good girls, they're going to go on and make, make a good cane farmer's wife or something like that, which didn't really sit in the right spot with me, so I completely ignored most of what they taught me. <laughs> um, I got past the Catholicism fairly early on gave that up as a as a massive joke and kept going without it um straight out of high school I went to Rockhampton which is again on the coast of Queensland but 700 kilometers south of here um almost it's directly on the Tropic of Capricorn so if anybody looks for that line on the on on their little globe it's Rockhampton is on the coast of Queensland for there. Um, and I did a few years in Rockhampton, um, ending up with an associate diploma in aquatic resource management. So that's um, water quality control and aquaculture and field techniques. So as a field technician, being able to support like a research scientist or something like that. So the research scientists would say, go out and fetch me 20 of these birds or something like that. And so you'd have to be able to go out and do that 
you know, find the get the permits and all the rest of it, and then go out and, and life trap these animals or you know, however whatever the permit was for. So we learnt all sorts of things like shooting and trapping and welding and carpentry and basic mechanics, you know, how to break into cars, how to hotwire them, um, <laughs> all the important parts of life, mapping cell technology, so being able to 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 grow stuff in in agar in the lab and stuff like that, fish dissection, all sorts of gory, messy stuff. Um, so I was there for three years. Um, there was a lot of partying and there was a lot of drinking um, because, you know, 17 through, through 20 away from home, that's what you do. And in, in Australia, the legal drinking age is 18, so everybody starts at 16. Um, <laughs> and I decided, for reasons unknown to me, I decided that I would continue continue studying because I was in the grief for studying. So I signed up to do a degree in marine biology here in Townsville at James Cook University. I lost you again at James Cook University. It froze. Yep. No worries. This, this um, phone is garbage. I hate it. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's a rubbish. This is the this is the phone that lives in the drawer to be the spare, spare, spare. Um, <laughs> Nothing, dear. I love Apple. <laughs> She's going to come in and peg no. one at your head. <laughs> yeah, she might. It's okay. It's, it's been almost 15 years now, so I can take it. Um, um, so yeah, you, uh, it cut off at, at James Cook University. I was going to do marine biology. I got but halfway through the first year of marine biology and thought, oh, I'm tired now, um, and took a break for a few years. Uh, there was coffee. And then I worked for a, for a few years. I, God, what did I do? Um, I did things like uh, testing machinery oils. So, you know, um, engine oils and gearbox oils and stuff like that to see what can do the engines were in and whether or not they were going to burn out. Um, there was, I worked in a sewing machine shop for a bit. I sold um, counted cross stitch, so fine, uh, fine linen cross stitches that I did myself. Um, I worked at the, the local aquarium here, so I was um, diving in the in the coral reef tank and in the predator tank. So diving with the black tip reef sharks and the turtles and things like that. Um, and then I worked at the local zoo here and that's where the crocodiles come in. So I worked with the crocodiles and the koalas for a bit. And then I decided that shoveling shit for 10 hours a day wasn't where I wanted to be. And so I went back to uni um, and got my degree in environmental science at James Cook and then kept going from there. Before we get too far, let me ask the question about uh, snake and animal handling. Tell me some more detail on the crocodiles. And I know, I know you had a snake show. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, as with a lot of zoos, there's, uh, you, you do um, animal, different animal shows during the day. And so, I would do koala shows. I would do the wombat show. There was a flying fox show, and that was before they discovered um, Hendra virus and Lissa virus in, in flying foxes. So um, there was also feeding uh, freshwater eels and turtles. So you'd get in your, your gum boots and stand sort of shin deep in the water with a big bucket of, of fish scraps and have these massive eels which are like a meter long and um sort of th as thick as your leg curling around your boots and trying to knock you over to get the fish um and i would do a snake handling show and one of the so i had two snakes that i would get out and one was about a meter long carpet python so it's sort of uh a creamy colour with brown and black splotches along its body. 
and it's a python so it's not venomous and this carpet snake would go i'd get it out and it's sort of, sort of only finger thick and it would go up and it would curl around the, t the hat my hat band so i had an akubra big broad brand hat and it would sit on the top of my hat and just stay there and the main reason it stayed quiet on my hat was because the other snake that i got out was a two meter black headed python and the black headed python's favorite food is other snakes so the carpet snake would stay very very still so that the black headed python wouldn't eat it and so I'd have this have a group of tourists in front of me, and I'd be doing the, doing a snake tour, snake show, and say, "So I've got these two snakes out, and we'd go around, and so everyone could touch the black-headed python, and then they'd say, Where, where's the second snake? We don't know. What are you talking about? You're being silly.' And say, "No, I've got two snakes here with me. You just have to find the second one." And then halfway through the show, people would realise that the second one was up on my hat, and they'd been really close to it all that time and not noticed. Um, and those were you know, snakes that were used to being handled. And so, you, you know, going out and picking up wild snakes like lunatic Alex does um, takes, a, takes a bit more training and, a, and, um, and legally takes a license to be able to do it as well. So um, some of the other shows that I would do was there was a dingo show, so the, the native dog here in Australia, um, and cassowary show, which is, that's terrifying. That's the scary one. So a cassowary is a flightless bird. It's slightly smaller than an emu, smaller than an ostrich. It has a big black comb on its head, solid comb, it's called a cask on its head and it has three toes and the inside toe, so the three toes, the inside toe is what's called a dagger claw and it's this claw about this big and if a cassowary is cranky enough with you, it can dis disembowel you with that claw. So they are very dangerous birds and getting up close with them is scary. <laughs> And there's Alex home and the dog's telling me about it now. Um, and of course, the, the big one was the crocodile shows that we would do. So we would do two feeding shows every day. And my favorite one to do was with a crocodile called Snappy, Snappy Tom. And Snappy Tom was about four meters long. And um, I would get a piece of bone and tie, tie the bone to a rope and tie the rope to, um, to the jetty that I was on, standing on because you don't get down too close to the crocodiles because, you know, they'll eat you. Um, so you tie the bone and throw it in the water and the crocodile will come and grab, snap at the, at the bone and grab it. And then if you, because of the way they hunt if you pull back on the food source so on the rope that's tied to the bone it makes them do a death roll and they roll their entire body over and the point of that is to if it if it was an animal is to flick the animal over and to break its legs so that it's easier for the crocodile to eat it also it pulls they they roll and pull back so it pulls the animal into the water so they they're more likely to drown and and not be able to kick the crocodile in the head on the way through. So I'd be, I'd get this bone and I'd pull on it and the crocodile would roll and roll and roll and roll and roll. And all the tourists would love it and take lots of photos and videos and things like that. And this was um, back before mobile phones were a big thing. And so, you know, people with their little, um, not quite super eights, but you know, their little video cameras, and, and cameras and things like that. And they'd be taking their photos. And one woman accidentally dropped the video cassette out of her camera into one of the other enclosures and it fell right beside one of the crocodiles. And she said, oh my gosh, I've dropped my video. Blah, blah, blah. So I had to rescue the video cassette 
from beside the crocodile. So it's like getting it out with a rake, trying to pull it out. And of course the crocodile bit it on the way past. So she got to keep this souvenir of her visit to the crocodile, crocodile zoo of her video cassette with a, with a hole in it that the crocodile had bitten. But um, crocodiles in zoos are very, very well fed. Um, they, you have to make them work hard to be able to work off the food that they've eaten because otherwise they just sit there and just get fatter and fatter and fatter and, and they don't want to eat because they don't need to eat. So making Snappy Tom do a death roll was, you know, here's his daily exercise to, to burn off a few calories so that he could do it. So not all the food would get eaten that you'd taken out for a show. So I had a leftover piece of bone one day and I was walking back to, to the kitchen to put it back in the freezer. And I thought, oh, this crocodile in another enclosure hasn't been fed much lately. I'll give it this bone. And this crocodile was about two and a half meters long and right beside the, the eight foot fence that was you know, for their enclosure. So I'm talking to some people and I said, I'll just give them, give this crocodile this bone to, so it can, it can have a snack. And I took the bone out of the bucket and I said, yeah, I'm just gonna drop it over the, over the, the fence beside its head. So I grabbed the bone, I took it, I put it up over the fence. And as I did that, the crocodile stood up on its hind legs and just about took it out of my hand. And I felt the breeze under my fingers as its jaws snapped shut underneath my fingers. And I was like, ah, 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 I'm a bit scared now. Um, that's not what you're supposed to do <laughs> with the crocodiles. <laughs> it's not, not the done thing. So, um, didn't do that again. <laughs> well, so tell me about your career developing after you uh, finished up university with, uh, I believe you said, an environmental science bachelor's. Yes. Yeah. So I was going to do honours, um, but my mum decided, well, no, she didn't decide. My mum was closer to dying at that stage. So I took time off to care for her. And then um, I got a job as an environmental scientist for a marine engineering company. Worked there a few years. Um, worked for uh, an organization called Conservation Volunteers Australia, um, who um, coordinates volunteers from all around the world to do conservation projects. So I was a team leader and uh, trainer for them for 16 years. And um, I got um, seconded from them to the company that I work for now, uh, NQ Dry Tropics, oh, 12 years ago, to do a project um, working with local landholders to help them to improve their land management. So by landholders, I mean people, it was people on rural, rural residential blocks. So outside of the city of Townsville, places like around where we live um, and people with, with blocks of usually bigger than five acres. So two hectares. Um, and so I would go to, people would register with the program and I would go to the property and I'd say, okay, what's, what have you got here? What do you want to do on your property? Do you have horses? Do you have cattle? Do you want to be able to ride your trail bike around and around in circles all weekend? Working with landholders to improve their land management on their properties. So what's good on their property, finding out what's, what problems, what challenges they face on their property and how the program that I was working on, how we could help them to improve things in their, on their property. Um, and so we'd wander around the property and look for, look for good plants, look for bad plants, look for any problems, that sort of stuff. I would write them a big report about what was on site 
and then we would offer them some funding to try and do that work on the property. So whether it was killing weeds or things like that on their property. Um, and after I did that for a number of months, kept going and then essentially they poached, the NQ Dry Tropics poached me from conservation volunteers and I've been with them for 11 years now. Alex has just come home. He's do fairly filthy and he's going to do some washing. Ah, oh, and belching. <laughs> As he should. As he should. That's right. He, you know, just belching, belching to America. Yay. <laughs> you told me last time about a project you're working on. Uh, I believe it was trash removal from the coast. The current project that I'm working on is called Protecting Beach Scrub Communities. And part of that is uh, removal of marine debris from the coastline uh, adjacent to the beach scrub areas. And marine debris is pr pretty much anything, any trash that's fallen off a boat. Um, and the east coast of Queensland gets a lot of um, tankers and and things like that up and down the up and down through the shipping lanes so uh, the amount of rubbish that comes off some of those boats is just ridiculous and it's not just the sort of the recreational boats it seems to be the big commercial boats that drop a lot of the stuff that we're collecting um some of the sites um get minimal debris and some of them just get tons and it'll be related to their position on the coast and, and the currents and things like that as to whether or not they get more debris than others. Oh, Jenna. So that's the sound of the old dog chasing the puppy, just to be helpful. Tell me about all the animals real quick then. All the animals. Well, there's a hairy one that's just coming out barking from the laundry. <laughs> <laughs> <They're>... <laughs> <They're going off. laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> That's Australian for I love you. <laughs> yes, Australian for I love you. Yes. Um, we have three dogs. The noisy one that people can hear is Jenna. She is nine and a half. Um, we have River of Doom, who is this one, who is the Sookie uh, three-year-old American Staffy Cross. And the, the one that's the quietest at the moment but is causing the most noise is the Border Collie Kelpie Cross. And she's just running away from the old one. Not making a sound, but just getting chased. There is also Henry the rooster and his nine hens. Henry the rooster, who we've heard singing a few times, and you said nine hens? Yeah, he has nine hens now, and Henry is quite, quite frankly a bastard. Um, he is an awful bird, but he, um, he does his job as a rooster. A rooster's job is to protect his hens. It's just that he protects the hens against everything, including us taking them food and things like that. Um, he has managed to leap a metre into the air and kick Alex in the balls with both feet. Um, I, both, <laughs> I missed it, so I didn't get a chance to get a video of that one. He didn't miss. <laughs> We'll need to recreate it for our next visit. <laughs> so he's lucky he doesn't have spurs. Yeah, he, we, we are very lucky he doesn't have spurs as a rooster. Um, one of our rooster, roosters in the past had massive spurs. Henry's pretty good. He doesn't have spurs, but he just has big funk, funky feet that he's really good at kicking with. And that's him now. So those, those are the, the on-purpose animals that we have. We also have lots of possums. So um, 
common brush tail possums are the are the our usual ones around here. We've probably got some gliders and things like that as well. Lots and lots of wild birds, um, quite a few snakes, but again, they're not on purpose. They just live here. Um, so yeah, that's that's our normal wildlife for this space. Tell me again the story of that uh, that squatter sitting there next to you that's been there for twenty some odd years now. Oh yes, the squatter. <laughs> in his hammock over there anyway so uh let's go back so i've been in this house for over 30 years now moved in here with my mother after she passed away i inherited the house um and after she passed away for reasons you know community reasons I got invited to a lot of things in our area because you know he's the orphan she's got nobody to look after anymore let's get her out and about so I got invited to um, some local theatre group things and the, the local theatre group was called the Outback Players but just after well, not long after mum died I got invited to a dinner party at, at some friends place and it was about halfway through the night before I realized that the dinner party was actually a going away party for this bloke. And it's like, oh, okay, you're going away. No worries. Have a nice trip. See ya. Um, didn't think anything more of it. In the year that followed, I got more involved with the theater, the, the theater group and did some theater restaurants and things like that. Um, and then after that, I was, we were doing another theatre restaurant and Alex and I sort of went, oh, that was you. Okay, yeah, right. Um, don't remember you, but yeah, sure. Um, and in sort of in July of 2020, we got together. 2020. 2020. 2020. 2020. 2020. Shit. 2000. <laughs> I can't I can't add up um J July of 2000 um we got together and within two weeks he'd moved into my house and so yeah there's this squatter who moved it's like five kilometers up the road from his dad's house to mine and um he moved in and we were like combining cd collections it's like well, now we've got two copies of this and there's three copies of this one and here's a cassette of that one as well. And so we had a lot of shared interests, which was nice. Um, and then... We both like my cooking. We, yeah, we both like his cooking, yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a very important part of it. Um, and then towards the start of... 2001 let's take that 20 years off again to the words the start of 2001 I discovered I was pregnant and so he he did the full-on get down on one knee and proposed thing um and not long afterwards I was um retrenched from my job as an environmental scientist for that marine engineering company um and I thought all right I'll um I'll hold off looking for another job just at the minute and um, organise this wedding instead. And, you know, we organised the wedding in, in three months. Um, I thought, oh, you know, I'll look for a job after that. That way I, I don't have to try and focus on two big things at once. So we got married and then we went off on our honeymoon and we went camping because we were so poor at that stage because I had no job and he was working as a cook in the service station. So, you know, poor as, poor as we were. So we went camping, which was a lovely thing to do anyway. And we had an esky full of alcohol and soft cheeses and pâtés and things like this. And we were just going to, you know, enjoy ourselves out in the bush. And then I discovered I was pregnant. And I was like, well, not going to have all that alcohol, not going to have all those soft cheeses. So that was, um, that was our son who turned 21 a couple of weeks ago. And then 
So I, I didn't go and get a job straight after the wedding after all that. I stayed home and made baby instead. Um, and then our daughter was still born an another two years after that. Uh, we had two under two for a while, which you know, was fun. And we did lots of play groups. So we had a, a play group um, in the area and we would go down and, and, and community raise all the local children together. Everybody would parent everybody else's children. And then kids went off to school. And by the time they went off to school, I was well and truly ready to go back to work by that stage. Um, because your brain just goes to mush if you don't use it enough. <laughs> and so I went back to working for conservation volunteers where I'd been before. And now we have a 21 year old who is living on campus at James Cook University. He's studying information technology. Um, and we have a 19 year old who is at the moment at work in the same kitchen that Alex used to work in at the service station down the road. So, which is a, an interesting little circle. Uh, we spoke last time about this. Um, <clears throat> tell me about the, the COVID period over there, because from the American perspective, like I mentioned last time, it appeared to be martial law. And- uh, Well, yeah, what? martial law in COVID. No, it wasn't quite that bad. There weren't guns in the streets from it. Um, <laughs> but the different states um, had different lockdown regulations and mask, re mask requirements and all that sort of stuff. And, um, yeah, so they closed the borders between states and things like this. And I... So... COVID was sort of like some of the first cases of COVID were like November, end of November 2019. Um, and then it had started to spread worldwide by the start of March 2020. I, I sort of had a panic myself about it. And I let, I started working from home about a week before everybody else in our office um sort of mid march i came home and then our office closed uh, towards the end of march 2020 um and everybody worked from home until at least september of that year and so like the place was like ghost town in 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 the city it was, you know, like four o'clock on a Sunday afternoon when everybody's having a nap, only that was, you know, 10 o'clock on a Monday morning. It was really quite strange. Um, but for being one of the first people out of the office to work from home, I was one of the first people back in the office because it was doing my head in staying at home. Um, and my mental health was was suffering with it. So... Um, I went back to the office because I needed to see people again <laughs> for <laughs> people being horrible things, but I still needed to see them. Um, and yeah, the border, the, the international borders got shut down and things like that. For, got shut down for quite a while. yeah, Western Australia got shut down for a, a, a longer time. And for us personally, the sort of like, there's, the interstate borders weren't really a big issue because we don't do a lot of interstate travel um, and all the work stuff had stopped. So we weren't, you know, there was no travel for work or anything like that. So it, those, those border closures didn't impact us directly. I know a lot of people were very upset about it, though. Uh, you know, families separated for birthdays and all that sort of stuff, and funerals and things like that. Yeah, wow. where yeah, we we've been very lucky. We, no, none of us have had COVID. Um, I've got my fifth vaccination booked for next weekend. Alex 
has had four vaccinations but won't get a fifth because he gets such a, a bad reaction from the vaccination that it knocks him about for about a week, which is not pleasant. Yeah, I'm sure it's not pleasant at all. Uh, I think I told you last time, uh, a lot of folks I know, myself included, have had COVID and, mm. you know, di different, different, some people have had a vaccine, some people have had two, some have had zero. So yeah. uh, anyway, let's see, what else did I have to bother you about? One final point, I think. You do things for fun that I surely do not. Tell me how all that running started. It's his fault. It's Alex's fault that I run. Um, he, when he is well, he is a very good runner. And I wish he was well again so that he could run some more because he is very good at it and it gives him great joy. However, he's been injured and he's been sick, so he hasn't been able to run. Anyway, he started running and so that I could spend time with him, I started running as well. Um, and we did things like we went to Paris and he ran the Paris Marathon. Um, we went to Canada and we both ran an ultra marathon in Southern Alberta. Um, we've run, uh, I've, ru I've run one marathon and the ultra and ha half marathons all over the place um, in Victoria, in um, Port, all through Queensland, you know, things like that. So we've done a lot of, tra uh, was it um, runcations, they're called. So you go on a vacation and you go for a race. Um, anyway, back to the, like November tw 2019, I went, worked out that I'd been running every day for about a month. And I thought, okay, this is, this is actually a run streak. So I just kept running every day and I have been running every day since November, 2019. So I'm into my fourth year of every day running. And um, so this morning I did um, 11 kilometers. So that's it. I don't know how many miles, there's some miles, seven or eight miles, I don't know. Um, was, I have that, run... was that about an hour ago, you posted a picture on Facebook, I think of a of you on a boardwalk somewhere. Was that on the yeah, run? That was this morning's run. Yeah. So that's the local national park, uh, which is, you know, two kilometers that way. So I've run, run every day for 1194 days. Um, and yeah, the, so this morning's run was very slow and interrupted a lot because I stopped and had a chat to some neighbors and their dog for about 20 minutes. And then I went into the national park and I saw another neighbor. So we had a swim for a while and then I came back. And so it was a very, it was a, a slow, um, relaxing run today. Glad to hear that, uh, that you're relaxing. I don't know about that, all that running, not my, uh, <laughs> not my scene. But no. nonetheless, uh, that pretty much wraps up my questions. Uh, do you have anything else interesting that may have happened in your life, maybe to your kids growing up or anything else that might be uh, surprising to somebody from this side of the world? Well, the, something that may be surprising to, to some people is that I can go for a run at four o'clock in the morning um, with no light on and not be worried about my personal safety. That's a big thing. Um, apart from feral pigs, but you know, feral pigs um, and the occasional snake, but I don't have to worry about people as a, as a personal safety thing. Um, or getting accidentally shot. Or getting accidentally shot. Getting accidentally shot seems to be a problem that a lot of Americans have and we don't have that problem here in Australia and we're really, really grateful that we don't have that problem. That being said, <laughs> a week ago, there was a drug raid like a kilometre and a half from our house 
and the guy had 13 rifles and like four buckets of ammunition um, <laughs> in his place and, what's that? and 800 grams of uh, of meth and some cocaine and 120 grand's worth of cash and it's like Whoa! <laughs> so yeah that sort of stuff it's hitting pretty close to home there yeah 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 and it's you know, a house that we go past every day <laughs> so yeah that was a bit of a, a bit of a surprise for everybody um Children in Australia go to school from February to December rather than from, what is it, September through to June because it's they have the summer holiday and the summer holiday for us is December through January, whereas your summer holiday is June, July. Um, so for us, we're just starting, we're just heading into autumn here. Um, which is very, very different from your autumn um, because our autumn is still, everything is still very green and all the leaves are still on the trees and they won't fall off until September, until spring. Until spring. <laughs> all our leaves fall off in spring. <laughs> to, to be completely awkward. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, our... our seasons are, are very different from yours and there is no snow. Burdick and snow. <laughs> Burdick and snow is ash from cane fires. Gotcha. I'm sure we have some of that here. There's cane fields all around where I am too. I didn't realize you were in cane country as well. No, yeah, no, you could, it's kind of all around where I live actually. A little bit distant from right where I live, but still, I mean, yeah. you could driving to New Orleans from where I live, you'll pass. If you go the right route, you'll pass a bunch of them. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, we've got, you know, anyway, sort of half hour drive, we're in cane country. Yeah. It's about, about the same here. Just my house looks a little bit different than yours. <laughs> and uh, my next door neighbor, I can almost touch when I go to the side of my driveway. Ah, I, um, I can't even see the other houses from where I am. If I go out the front, I can see the house across the street, but that's about it. We're right. on an acre, acre and a half and it's full of trees and it's really nice. In spring you can. There you go. In, yeah, in spring you can when the leaves all fall off the trees. <laughs> or if a cyclone comes through and shreds them all off the trees, yeah. We well, get, let's hope get, that does not happen. That's right, that's but, right. But look, let me thank you for, I think, a fourth time, third time, fourth time, for your time today, yet again. <laughs> let's and hope this one works. I hope you pressed record. Well, like the little red button says record. So hopefully this one, you know, on this dodgy ass bloody Apple phone. <laughs> you tell that, tell that squatter to mind his own business. We got this. <laughs> He's laughing at you. <laughs> Good. But I didn't hear him. What do you say? He said with you. He's laughing with you. Absolutely. Not <laughs> but that's fine with me either way i'll take it but look I'll, I'll keep you posted on progress with this thing and hopefully we have no more issues yes yes that'd be nice you will be able to tell all the stories yourself i've almost got to memorize but i i do keep notes. <laughs> again i thank you very much we'll be in touch no worries thanks a lot tim <laughs>